Thanks, Shane. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So I'll, rec I'll introduce myself. I'm Katie Gray, and I am the head of the Archives and Cataloging Division at New Mexico Highlands University, and I am a consultant on the Manitos Project. Amy, and those of you probably already know Amy. <laughs> yes, just in case, um, for those of you who don't know me, I am recently um, from the Digital Initiatives and Scholarly Communication Program at the University of New Mexico. And I am also a consultant with the Manitos Community Memory Project, and I'm really glad to be here. Yay! Yay. <laughs> so I'm going to just go ahead and click through the slides, Katie, and we'll just Absolutely. chat whatever we think of. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, is PowerPoint going to? There we go. OK. So. I'm sure um, most people are aware of this, but people, many, many lawyers make their entire livings off of copyright. So it's it's a huge area and we couldn't possibly tell you even beginning, you know, the basic, we'll, we'll cover the basics, but beyond, there's so much more and it's very, lots of gray areas and it's really hard to um, give definitive answers about a lot of things, which is frustrating. And I, I fully get that. And I'm also really aware that there's a lot of, uh, how do I say this, like areas that copyright doesn't adequately address or ways that it is not fair. And um, I can't really do anything about that. Um, what I want to do, and I, I'll, you know, maybe Katie will chime in too, is just to give people information about what the law is to the best of my knowledge and give you some resources where you can do more research. Um, and the goal to, for me is to protect the project because, um, you know, the, I feel like this is a really important project and it matters to, to this community and um, we don't want to do things that are going to put that at risk. That's my opinion. What do you think, Katie? Oh, absolutely. I, I agree. This is a copyright is always a very sticky situation for for everyone, including institutions that have been at this for a long time. And there are very few hard and fast rules. I say very few because there are one, one or two hard and fast rules, but there are very few. And so it can get very confusing. So um, uh, Amy has put together some resources that will hopefully help you to navigate at least the basics of that. And, um, and then, you know, we can always um, also, you know, give you our opinions on, on matters as well. And I will say that, that whenever I think of copyright issues, I think about it, I mean, largely people tend to think about it from a legal standpoint, you know, what, what are your legal rights and responsibilities. I also tend to think of it in an ethical standpoint as well, because you, you do have to respect the rights of creators. Um, it, or the other way, including yourself. If you're the creator, you need to have your rights respected as well. So this is, um, I, I think we're largely going to be talking about legality, but I do want you to keep in mind that there are some, um, you know, this, this also gets into ethics as well, in Excellent. my opinion, at least. Excellent point. <laughs> Excellent point. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a two-way street in a way. If we respect the law and we expect other people to respect the law, then that protects our work too, to the degree that 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 fits our situation, right? So let me go to the next slide. Here we go. Um, so so this kind of is a, a nice segue from what Katie just said, um, but there is a purpose behind copyright and the idea behind it is to stimulate creativity. So people can, or are more willing, let's say maybe, to take the time to make creative works because they know that they're going to get some benefit from that for some period of time. And that, that's another whole big area that we probably won't get to talk about too much, um, the, the, the terms, the length of time. But, um, you know, that, that's kind of the, the idealistic principle behind the law, right? What do you think? It, it can feel like it gets
gets a little lost sometimes because we do talk a lot about just the legality of it and can you or can't you use it. Um, but it is there, you know, to to sort of it, it does have that background that it's there to protect the creator and and therefore to encourage um, more creation, just as Amy was saying, so that people know that that um, they will be able to benefit from their works and will be protected um, by the law. So right. And we'll come back to that at the end when we talk about some of the ways that some of the, the creative ways that we can work with materials that we might not have the right or the legal right to use. But we'll come back to that. So if you're the owner of a copyright to, let's say, a, a creative work like a photograph or an essay or a poem, what does that mean? What do you own? These are the things you own. You have the right to reproduce that item. You have the right to distribute that item. You can perform or display the work, right? You can hang the photograph in a gallery. If it's a play, you can, you know, set up a performance or a piece of music, you can perform it and to create derivative works. So an example of a derivative work might be um, if someone writes a novel using characters from another person's work, um, that happens a lot like in the science fiction writing community. A lot of times people wanna use characters that already exist and make up more stories about them. So those that would be one example of a derivative work. Another example is like a parody of a song, things like that. Go ahead, Katie. I was gonna say, and I think it's important at the beginning when we're talking about this to make a distinction between ownership of the copyright and ownership of an item. So just because you may own an item, that does not necessarily mean that you also have the copyright to that item. For example, if you have a photograph that, you know, a modern photograph, you may own a copy of that it, you may have a copy that was given to you, but the creator of that, the photographer, is actually the one that has copyright claim over that item. So just keep that in mind as we're talking about copyright, that that's not necessarily the same thing as physical ownership. Right. And that gets especially more complicated when we're talking about digital materials, because yeah. there's so much more stuff regulation and control of the of rights to digital items when you back in the day when you bought a book you could give that book to someone else right and that's fine you can't necessarily make a copy of a song that you download from amazon and give it to your friend right it it plays out differently yeah. So, <laughs> there are ways I you mean, can do that. You, can. Not, there, you shouldn't do that. It's possible. It's possible. I, I but really it's not. <laughs> yeah, but it's, you know, it's um it's regulated. Let's just yeah. say that. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So there's probably questions about this. Shane, should we take questions for a couple minutes or should we keep going? Uh, yeah, no, there's, uh, well, there's some comments from Marissa. So Marissa, if you had something that you wanted to ask or contribute, uh, that's what we have so far is three comments from Marissa. Oh, I oh, just, I see. I'm, I'm, I've worked in the music business and I manage the intellectual property of a historian. So I've got some knowledge of copyright. Um, someone can also do a derivative of their own work. Exactly. And that's that's one of the right. That's one of the four things that you get when you own copyright is the right to create a derivative work. Absolutely right. Yeah. Unless you've licensed your stuff to someone else. Right. Um, right. And you don't need permission to do a parody of someone's song. Um. <laughs> yes. And there have been a lot of lawsuits about parodies in the music yeah, business, as I'm sure you're aware. So, so, so again, that's Al, a great area. We're trying, weird, to, we're trying to make weird, it as clear as we can. Weird Al Ankovic gets away with it all the time. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I mean, this is this is anecdotal, but I hear that he almost always asks the artist if it's okay. Yeah, because he's because he's respectful. And that's yeah. the courteous and thing. And that goes to, to Katie's point about ethics, right? Yeah, and that's the courteous Absolutely. thing to do. And most yeah. people are going to say, oh, Weird Al? Yeah, that means I'm going to make some money, too. Because you end up then... <laughs> Right. A licensing agreement. And so that is all the good part. Right. right. And then finally, registration. Okay. I, I'm, I missed that part. I muted myself. You, you, you need to register your copyright? Yeah. 
it, it's okay. 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 So we'll go on, but we'll, I'm sure we'll come back to that stuff. That's good information. So the previous slide was the four things that you have the right to if you own the copyright. If you are not the copyright owner, what, how, how does copyright constrain you then? Or how can you, what are some exceptions to the strict copyright rules, right? One thing you can do is look at whether the item is in the public domain. And I bet Katie knows a lot more about public domain than I do because I'm not a library. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm actually gonna um, I'm gonna drop a link in the chat to a um, um, a really nice chart from Cornell University um, from their legal department there, um, which just it, it's not like I said a lot of these are not cut and dry, but it at least gives you some um, some guidance when it comes to um, items that are in the public domain and when they become uh, in the public domain. And there is a difference between items that have been published and items that have been that are unpublished. Um, so, you know, like the when I when I was saying that there are very few sort of hard and fast rules, one of them is is that um, things that were published before 1926 are in the public domain. That's 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 a rule, uh, and and it changes slightly as time goes by. So anything that that's been published before 1926 is in the public domain, and then it gets a little bit a little bit dicier because like things that were published between 1926 and 1977 have to have been published with a copyright notice in them, and then there are also rules about whether or not the copyright owner applied for extended copyright. So all of these other rules start to come in um, the closer in time we get to when something has been published. So that's why I like this chart from Cornell because it really starts to help you um, navigate some of those. And then once you get into those, then, then you have to start seeing about, okay, did, they, did somebody apply for copyright? Did they apply for renewal of copyright? Um, but it is, especially um, when you are use, when you're doing historical research and historical work, a lot of people are relying on older materials anyway. So, you know, you're, you're pretty safe if it's something that's been published before 1926. But for unpublished works, it is the life of the author or creator plus 70 years. So you have to know who created that unpublished item and then when they died, because then it's 70 years after there, after that. So, um, but I, I find that this, um, 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 play this thing from uh, I'm sorry everybody I see in the chat that I sent that just to Amy so she has shared it with all of you in there. but I find it that's a, a really good place to start and that's right. also how you see a lot of a lot of places like if you've ever used happy trust if you've ever used the internet archive um, a, a lot of places especially institutions start with these older works and digitize them and put them up online. That was sort of the first wave of, of materials that were um, digitized and put online because they were in the public domain. Absolutely. And so you can see how it starts to get complicated pretty fast. It does. It does. I'm trying to put the slides back up and not having much luck. Can people see the slides or no? Oh, here we go. How's that? We see the slides and then your sidebar with the, all the slides, but we do see your slides. Okay, good. Yeah. Let's see if I can get the slideshow back. There, that's better. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So Katie, uh, there's Katie's link to the Cornell chart, and then there's another link to a blog from Stanford about public domain and fair use and some stuff from the copyright office. Now the copyright office stuff is going to make your eyes roll back in your head if you're like me, but it's, you know, if you really are into like getting the info from the horse's mouth, that's a good place to start. So another thing you can do is you can obtain permission from the owner. And again, this can sometimes be really simple if it's your next door neighbor, if it's somebody who's famous, or if it's someone who's dead, <laughs> those can be really, really difficult. Um, Sorry. Um, so, uh, for example, I've done this a couple of times 
in the course of my former work at UNM. And um, social media can be actually a really good way to find people. I found people on Facebook and gotten permission to do things. Um, so this is not outside the realm of possibility at all. Um, go ahead, Katie, take it away. Well, no, I was, I was just going to say, you know, this is, this goes to what Marissa was saying earlier too, that a lot of times if, if you ask somebody, they will say yes. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a matter of legality, but it's also a matter of respect. And, um, and especially I think when it comes to uh, people who are um, in the sort of um, genealogical field, um, which I, I know this project dovetails a lot with, with people who are interested in their genealogy. A lot of times genealogists are very sherry. You know, um, you know, to 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 um, um, help one another out. Um, not always, but I've found that that most genealogists are very um, very open like that. So so, but I think it is important to obtain permission. This is sometimes the easiest way to go go about it. And absolutely. Um, and and you know, sometimes sometimes you can't find the creator. But I think that there is an element there of due diligence. You know, have you done your due diligence in trying to find? Um, and obtain permission for the for the materials. Right, that's been my experience too. That a lot of times people are happy that you're interested in their work, and they the reason they made it was so that people would share it and use it, and um, they're just thrilled that you care. So um, I I love this one. This is a great um, option if you can find the person or their heirs. Sometimes I've I found someone's daughter through Facebook. So. All right, what's next? Um, oh, fair use. Oh my goodness. So, <laughs> Katie, don't you love fair use? It's it's this. You know, fair use is a can of worms within a can of worms <laughs> because fair use is very um, subjective. Um, and do you um, I, do you have a slide that has the sort of fair use? Uh, I didn't make a slide for it because I didn't know how far down the rabbit hole we wanted to go, but <laughs> I think that we can talk about, I can certainly look at my notes and um, we can talk about the four, four cases. Now, again, um, the, how do I say this? What, okay, what I would like people to take away from this workshop is not fair use and not like the all the little picky de little details because it is such a gray area and there's there's such a huge possibility of getting into trouble um, when you're trying to do something under fair use. If you can find the person whose work it is, getting permission is way simpler and way more foolproof, right? Would you agree with that? Absolutely, absolutely, okay. yeah. Because uh, because yeah, when you start getting into fair use, then it is really subjective, and you have to start thinking about the four qualities of fair use and. And um, which which we can touch on really quickly if you guys yeah. want to want to to talk about that. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay. So so fair use. Um, and um, I you know I am taking this by the way from a resource that Amy shared, which I'm sure she'd be happy to, to share if, you, if she hasn't dropped it in the chat already. Um, so this is from um, the library at Wisconsin. University of Wisconsin, I think, at Madison, maybe. Yes, yes, um, the library school. Yes. Um, so when you're when you're thinking about fair use and whether or not your use of an item it falls under fair use. And, and I'll be honest, this is something mostly that institutions deal with. This is something that when you start getting into fair use, that's not something that that individuals usually um uh have to have to deal with but um but we'll go over i'll go over it real quick so when you're considering whether or not and there is this great this great website um when you're considering whether or not your use of an item is fair use um there's first the purpose and the character of the use so for example, um, it tends to be considered more fair use if you are using something for an educational nonprofit purpose. You know, if you're using it, and a lot of a lot of teachers 
um, use materials through fair use because they are teaching. They're not doing it for profit. They're not, they're not turning, um, turning it into something else that they're going to make money off of. So the purpose and character of your use is one of the things that will determine if it's fair use. Then there is the nature of the copyrighted work itself, whatever it is that you're using, whatever it is that you're borrowing from. It tends to be considered more fair use if it's something factual versus something creative. You know, like if you lift sections from, you know, the latest New York Times bestseller, that's that's not quite as fair use as if you're just using facts that are from a factual textbook or something like that. Um, and these are much more complicated. I'm just giving you a really brief gloss of what these, these topics are. Um, then there's the amount and the substantiality of the portion taken. Um, and that means how much of it are you using, right? So if you're using, you know, if, if, you're, if you're using something from a pamphlet and the pamphlet is 15 pages and you quote seven and a half pages of that, you've quoted half of that pamphlet. Whereas if you quote seven pages from a book that is a thousand and ten pages long, that's a much smaller amount of that book. It's a much smaller portion that you're using. You're not you're not using half of that person's writing. But yeah. I think this is the one where the impact piece comes in as well, because if that seven pages that you take out of the thousand page book is where the murderer's identity is revealed, <laughs> that's a really significant portion of that work exactly. um, versus the first chapter where they're just setting everything. So, so again, like this is what we're trying to convey. I think it's just, this is so complicated that it's not necessarily something you want to rely on for, to defend your own use, because like Katie said, um, it's mostly institutional. And I think it also, you have to go to court really to to yeah. have any of this play out which no one wants to do yeah. so <laughs> and and then the fourth factor is about is about the market is about whether or not your use of this material is going to impact whether or not the original creator can sell their work um because you don't i mean that's part of what copyright is there for is to protect the rights of that creator to get compensation for their work. So, so whether or not what you're doing is going to impact, you know, if, if I can borrow Amy's analogy there, like if you, you know, if you share who would the murderer was and how they did it is any, but you know, that might impact whether somebody wants to pick up the mystery and read it or not, you know? So, um, so those are all of those, those four factors that go into fair use. But again, they're they're very kind of gray and squishy. And so it, it might not be something that you want to to really enter into. But I want you to be familiar with what that means, because you'll see that come up. You'll see that bandied about when people talk about copyright and, and using materials is whether or not it's fair use. Right. And that's it, it really is very complicated. And even institutions that deal with this on a, on a, you know, ongoing basis, still have a problem with figuring it out. And as Amy said, the final arbitration actually go, comes down to the courts. If it comes down to an actual, you know, push comes to shove of whether or not your use is fair use, it, it could even end up in the courts. And so that's really not maybe a rabbit hole that you want to fall, fall down. But I do want, I do think it's good for you to, to at least know what, what that means when somebody talks about that topic. Right. And if you do think that it applies in your case, use some of the resources that we're giving and do more research to find out if that's actually going to hold up in the end. And you can, again, I, I highly recommend if you want to look into it a little bit more, this site here um, that, um, that I was just cribbing from, from and that Amy is sharing, this has some great information and also has some nice little um, exercises that you can do where you can, is this fair use or not? And you answer the questions and it'll tell you whether or not it is. So it's a really great website. Yeah, so if you like hands-on learning, that's definitely yes. a cool thing to go through. <laughs> yeah, me too, <laughs> me too. Okay, so now I want to talk for just a couple minutes specifically about digital, digital materials and also um, materials that you get from other websites because that question did come up for this project and there's a lot of genealogy material online there's a lot of scanned public records online and the problem that we run into is that um, institutions let's say like like 
I'll use my own experience. I worked at the Digital Initiatives Project. I scanned a bunch of stuff. Um, that's an investment. Now, the stuff that I scanned, we put out open access because, um, you know, it's a university and they get public money and, and whatnot. But a private company, let's say like Ancestry.com, they have a financial investment in those in the production of those materials they paid someone to scan them now again i'm not saying i'm not commenting on the correctness or the ethicality of this this is just the law right they own the digital representation of those records because they created it or they paid someone to create it and when you sign up for an account at ancestry.com and i think that's a paid site but i'm not sure um, but there are other ones that give you free accounts but it doesn't matter because because you're going to see something like this. I hope you can see this. When you sign up for your account, they're going to make you check this box that says you've agreed to the terms of service. We're still, we're still, we're still on the library at uh, Wisconsin site. Oh, shoot. Sorry about that. Let me, um, let me switch over back to the slides, which would be really helpful. Um, oh my goodness. I'm so sorry. I get so like, um, discombobulated with all my windows. Oh, here, here's my Zoom. Okay, <laughs> here's my share screen. Oh my goodness. Okay, and we're gonna look at the slides. There we go. Can you see that? Yes. yes. Okay, so this is a little representation of just some generic website. Um, but almost always you, you check this box, right? And we never click on this to read the terms for I never do. I will fess up. I never ever read those things because they're horrible and boring and long and uh, they making me googly eyed. However, then when you let's say download a scan of records from a church in Los Lunas, one of my colleagues has done some great work with church records from there. Um, the the site agreement that you agreed to when you made your account says that you can't put that on another website, basically. Um, and I have a link in case anyone is curious to the ancestry.com terms and conditions. And this is just an example again, but almost every site is going to do something like this just for the reasons that we've already discussed, right? To protect their own whatever investment they've made in creating digital materials and putting them online. There's also in this, it, at this link, there's some really interesting information about how they handle any information that you upload, which would be a really good thing to understand if you're adding materials to their site or another site like that. You wanna make sure you understand what you're agreeing to. Now, others, in my opinion, was pretty nice. They said, you keep ownership of it. If you tell us you want us to take it down, we will, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's not always the case. Like Facebook, at least <laughs> before I deleted my account because of their horrible policies, um, claimed ownership to all of the stuff you upload there, right? If I uploaded a photo of my dog to Facebook, Facebook says they own that and they can sell it to a dog food company because my dog's super photogenic um, to sell dog food. I don't like that. Um, so again, like this is really important to be aware of when you're um, using other sites. You want to know what you're agreeing to. I'll shut up, Katie. Go ahead. No, no, I, I completely agree. And I, I don't have a lot to add there, except that we all, I think, my personal opinion, and I am still on Facebook, unless it goes down again, um, you know, but, but that is something that we need to be very aware of when we share stuff online. And, so, and, and it does all of this copyright stuff, you know, we said from the beginning, all this copyright stuff goes both ways, protecting people whose work you are using, but also protecting your work that, that other people might want to use. So, so you just need to be super careful about what the terms of service are that you're agreeing to, um, not only for the materials that you get from these sites, but from the materials that you upload to these sites. Because almost all, you know, I mean, that includes, you know, all of the social medias and then the, the genealogy sites like Ancestry and, um, and Family Search, because a lot of that, you know, a lot of people upload their own stuff to that as well. So just be super careful with what, with what you are, um, just so that you're in the know, you know, it's, you know, like I said, I'm still on social media, right? So I, I but I know what, what I'm entering into when I, when I, um, when I do that. Hey guys, just so you know, uh, Claire Coutte has raised her hand. 
Great. Oh, great. Thanks. Um, Claire? do you want to go ahead, Claire? Do you, right, you have a question about this specific stuff, or more? Is it a more general question that we should talk about at the end? Well, I guess it's somewhat specific to this, okay. and maybe it can be kind of like a bookmark to the end. Um, in terms of like when we're doing, say, audio recordings, which is a lot of what we're doing with Quest of Stories, questions like this come up with the people we're recording because it's almost like a co-creation. And um, as opposed to some institutions where, um, where people come in and they actually sign away their rights, you know, we're really trying to be very conscious of almost dual ownership and it's a very strange like I'm still feeling like we're trying to navigate this it's very murky or like say we're the ones photographing them doing something or videoing or something um I'm curious about what thoughts I guess this is a question um for all of you but also for Estevan and Shane too if if there has been like a terms of service almost created for the Manitos Community Memory Project because that's kind of that question has come up with people like, okay, well, what's going to happen with this stuff that is, you know, like, I know people are going to be able to look at it online, but how, you know, what's, what, how does this go? Because we're kind of talking about like educational copyright is kind of what we're asking for them to give us, um, you know, for, so I guess if we could circle back around and then maybe, um, maybe Shane could talk to the point about terms of service or, you know, it's funny because I don't even know if people, like, would they need an account to like say download something or how would the archive even work in that way in comparison to say ancestry.com? You know, what is, is there, it, it, I guess, do you, are you guys kind of understanding my question a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Shane, do you want to say specifically? Well, Let's go ahead and um, so Claire, I would say, because I have sort of an answer for you, but let's go ahead and like remind me at the end and I will address it later just so Great. the yeah. presentation will happen, but remind me later and say, hey, answer that question about specifically what the Minato's archive is doing. So, um, so yeah, so let's do that. Let's go that way with it. If Sounds that's great. Okay. okay. So yeah. Much. Yeah. I, I think what I would say in general, though, is that um, you can create any kind of agreement with the person that you want. Um, and if you want to return the copyright to them mm -hmm. and say the owner, the owner of this material is the person who's being, you know, Mrs. So-and-so who's being featured or who's the, the subject of the photograph, you can do that. Um, I just put a link in the chat to the Creative Commons, which is another really nice way that you can say this material, we're just, we're giving it to anyone they can do and there and there's a there are different licenses that you can choose from um so you can decide whether you want to allow it only for educational purposes whether you want to allow any use of it um so again i would encourage you to to take a look at that um katie was there anything you wanted to say about that the only thing I would add is, you know, not to muddy waters even more that are already kind of murky, um, but also keep in mind, particularly when you're doing like oral interviews, oral histories, things like that, you also need permission from the interviewer. So, you know, so there are three parties that really need to be a part of that. That's the interviewee, the interviewer, because they are also being recorded. Um, during that, that, and then the institution under whose auspices it's it's um, being done, and and you know we can get, um, you know Shane has a an answer about Manito specific right. stuff um, right. when, when we get to recording. But that's a, that's an interesting area though because I think um, historically um, oral histories especially were credited to the researcher, yeah, and a lot of times the person who was being interviewed wasn't even mentioned like they weren't considered an author they weren't and i i've seen that changing which is which i think is wonderful and i think that when we're creating new things that's one of the things the opportunities that we have is to push that envelope right more in the direction where we think it should be where the author of that content should be the person whose whose story it is not the person who thought up a few questions to ask them to kind of draw them out um editorializing a little bit there but absolutely <laughs> katie's totally right that you know it's perfectly valid to 
include both the interviewer and the interviewee as as creators right as authors or just the person who's being interviewed i mean like i said as an institution you can or a, or a community group you can create a release that gives people really clear information about what you're going to do with this thing where it's going to be available who's it going to be available to um what might happen to it because when you put something on the internet and i think we talked about this before um you pretty much lose control of what happens to it um again that's the reason why places like ancestry.com have those huge terms of service because um people can download things and if they're not if they don't care about being ethical they can do whatever they want so mm -hmm. um that's definitely a thing to be aware of um i have more to say about being creative but i want to make sure that if shane or katie has another comment on this topic that they get a chance mm -hmm. to do that I will be uh, verbose later when I answer Claire. Um, and unless Katie has something, just also want to point out that Pat has uh, raised her hand as well. So okay. Yeah, I don't have anything more. If we want to, okay, Pat, if you want to chime uh, in. Yes, I actually was just uh, curious. When you're interviewing an individual, would it be a better idea? I've seen interviews where the interviewer is not seen, only the person being interviewed. I think that's a stylistic choice, but I think that it, from personally, I think it's more impactful if the interviewer is not seen um, because this is that person's story and the interviewer is, is more of a facilitator of that story. Um, I think just from, just from a legal standpoint, you know, you just want to have the interviewer sign off just so everybody has, has agreed to the same sort of, you know, usage rights. But, but personally, I think, I think it's better if the interviewer is not seen, but then again, maybe if the interviewer is somebody that has a personal rapport with that person, if somebody is interviewing their grandmother or their grandfather, and then there's that family element, then maybe you do want the interviewer and the interviewee both, you know, on screen, if you're doing like a video. So I think that's really right. a stylistic choice. You know, it's about what, what kind kind of oral history or what kind of interview you're doing, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. And, and I will say very briefly, just to add on to Katie's thought is, you know, all of this, that this is even a discussion to my mind, uh, reflects the changing landscape of, of what it means to collect material like this. It can be a lot more participatory than it used to be. It can be more workshopped than it used to be. You know, these kind of interviews used to be done in a very kind of formal way. And now there's a, a lot more variety in how, like, I think, for instance, about like what um, uh, they did recently, um, the recent project that Imbuda Valley Library did, which was following a format that I can't remember the format, uh, but you know where it is, where the participant, where where both the interview and interviewee are participants. Like somebody is, you know, somebody who is whose identity is being emphasized is is interviewing somebody else whose identity is also being emphasized. And these are kind of new forms. But anyway, I'm yeah. babbling. I'm going to stop there. No, I, that's a, that's a perfect on, point, Shane. That is question. such a great point because you know. It, it might not even be interviewer and interviewee. It might be a dialogue between two people that that you know went through the same experiences or something like that. So it doesn't even have to be you know answer, question answer question answer. It can be more like a dialogue. Exactly. Um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So that's just one way that. I'm going to refer back to my get creative um, <laughs> thing here, but I want to talk just for a minute about um, going back to the issue of, especially I think public records that have been scanned and put online by a site that considers that proprietary content, right? That they're saying you can't download this and put it on another website because it's because we own this um, because they paid someone to go scan it from the town hall or whatever. Um, one of the things that I thought about when this question came up for this project was that um, a way to, and I'm not, I'm not going to say get around that, but a way to be able to um, reference that content that you're not, that you can't get permission to use in and of itself is to, um, you know, use it, let's say, maybe this is the, the 
kind of the traditional way to use that would be in like a scholarly article, right, where you would cite that as a source. You would say, um, you would talk about, you know, your own experience. And I went to this church and I did this research and I saw that my grandmother and my grandfather were married in this church on this date or, you know, whatever, whatever the context of the project is. Um, and then you can um, link to the material, right, as a, as a source, as a, a something that's supporting your your original work that you're making based on that. So that would be another way that you could um, incorporate the information that particularly stood out to you from this source that you found that you're not able to share because it's owned by a different entity. Does that make sense? I feel like I just, I didn't make any oh, totally. sense there. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I might also add that in the same vein of when we were talking toward the beginning about asking for permission from the owner, in that same vein, you could go to the owning institution because the vast majority of these materials that have been digitized for family search or ancestry or other sites like that, those are physically owned by institutions or individuals. Um, for example, I know that the, the institution that I worked for before I came to Highlands, um, we had some of our materials digitized by FamilySearch. Um, and the, the owning institution got a copy of all of the digital files. That was, that was the trade-off. So Family Search, you can digitize our materials and put them online, but we also get a copy of it. So you could just go and, and they will tell you on these sites where the originals are. And so you could just contact that library, contact that archive and say, hey, I, I have this material, you know, that I want to use that's in your collection. Can I have permission to use it? So that's another way to sort of um, go directly to the source. And that's part of why citing where you got stuff is so important, not only for you, but for other researchers so that they can go back and find those materials or maybe more materials on that same topic at that institution. So, so be aware that's one way to do it too. You can go directly to the source. Okay, and archivists, I will just say after having worked with a bunch of them at UNM, they love it when people want their stuff. They love it. Totally. They are desperate. They, oh my goodness, if you call up UNM or you send them an email and say, you have this thing in your, in your, in the basement, right? There's two levels of archives underneath the library at UNM um, that are, that are not open to the public. Um, you know, this is on B2, according to your finding aid. Um, can you, can I get a copy of this? They will scan it. They will run down there and take it off the shelf and scan it for you and send you a copy. Now, I'm maybe exaggerating a little bit because, you know, they do have other work that they're responsible for doing, but seriously, they, they love it. They love it when people are interested in their materials. So that's a great point is that just because um, family search says, no, you can't use our copy doesn't mean you can't make your own if you happen to live near the place that ha holds the records, or if it's an institution that's far away, but they have archivists, I will tell you, they will make you a copy yeah. and send it to you. And I will say that I think, I think you'll, you'll have a lot more luck with that when it comes to dealing with public institutions, universities, public libraries, public archives, um, but, but where you might, you might run into some problems going back to what we were originally talking about with permissions and copyright is private institutions, um, because some private institutions supplement their, their overhead by usage fees, you know, and particularly with photographs, particularly with photographs. So just keep that in mind, uh, places like, you know, nonprofits, places like, um, um, historical societies or places like that, that they, they will sometimes charge you to use um, their images. But that's also one of those things you need to be careful of, of who owns that copyright. If it's one of those institutions that's like that, then you won't be able to share it for freely on a site like this. Right. But, but, but by and large, Amy is right. Most, most of us are yes. just like, take, take the stuff, take the stuff. Yes. And the, the people that I worked with, I mean, 
you know, they differentiate between like if, it, if a publisher contacts them and wants a high res copy of a photo to print in a book, they are going to charge that $25. But if it's someone from the community who says, you know, I'm doing my own research on my parents and my grandparents, you know, my family history, um, can you send me a co you know, a copy of these pages of this book? Um, they're, they usually will waive the fee, at least in my, this is my experience with the library at UNM. And I'm assuming that archivists are probably mostly like that everywhere. We mostly are. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> so if um, I, I want to make sure we leave enough time for Shane, because I know he has a lot to say about um, the specifics of this stuff pertaining to um, stuff that goes into the Manitos archive. So can we give him the floor for a little while? Yeah, if I could just piggyback one more more topic. Sorry, Shane. <laughs> I'm good. I didn't um, expect to talk today, so you guys do your thing. I'm gonna, okay. Like, on on that that whole separation of public versus private institution, that also um, that also comes into play when when you're talking about publications uh, that were published by a government entity. So, and that goes into what we were talking about earlier with um, things that are in the public domain. So works that were prepared by uh, or created by somebody who is a government employee in their auspices as a government employee, those things are in the public domain, which is why you will find a lot of government publications on like the Library of Congress website and stuff like that. Those are in the public domain because they were created with public money under the auspices of the government. So that's something to keep in mind too um, um, when you're thinking about public domain and whether or not you can share something is that uh, whether or not it's a, it's a government publication. Just a little something to keep in mind. Great point. Now Shane. 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 So, and I myself do want to leave um, uh, time for questions and stuff as well. So I think I'm gonna give sort of a brief overview in particular to respond to, to Claire's sort of question or, or set of, um, I guess you could say concerns. Um, and, uh, but I'll be sort of an overview and then I can ask, answer questions about it or I can answer them uh, later or something like that. But um, I think what is helpful to say, and, and Claire, redirect me if I go off of what was your original kind of question, which is, you know, I think that in regards to, so first of all, thanks, because that was a really good overview of the complexity of the landscape of permissions and use and things like that. So um, I think that in some ways, the easiest thing to say about it in regards to the Menitos project specifically, is that you know we are trying our best to actually really represent the spirit of you know a community archive and what that meant all the way back to when we started this project about empowering the community and making sure the community is in control of the process of this archive. So in a lot of ways, just to say it, and I know this sounds kind of pithy or corny, is it's not our archive, it's your archive, but we mean that in a very specifically serious way. So what it means in regards to things like copyright and things like that is that everybody who's contributing into the archive is empowered to define all these things like you know, Amy and Katie just laid out and dealing with that complexity and, and defining those permissions and comfort levels and zones for yourselves the people that you're working with, et cetera. Now, what that means too, is we are very painfully aware, like was mentioned, that the internet is the internet. And there is so much that we can do and so much you can do and anybody can do about things. And so at the core strategy for the Menitos project is that we have adopted as a default, a Creative Commons configuration. And now that configuration, which we have to dial in, which I know Katie is going to help us define when it gets to that point, is the configuration, which basically means, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Creative Commons or copy lefting, which is what sort of what that is, it's a way of being able to share freely in the spirit of sharing, but in a way that protects your rights. So you're not copywriting because you want to like build a big wall and place a barrier between yourself and what you want to share with the world or the community but 
what it does is allows you to share and gift in that way, but also protect yourself, the integrity of your material, the integrity of your collections. So the copy left, I think we're looking at basically boils down to, you know, you can use this as long as you don't make money off it and as long as you don't change it anyway. So nobody can take a picture of your grandmother and either make a profit off it by putting her on a mug on Redbubble or take her picture and like turn it into some kind of weird Andy Warhol thing, you know, that changes the nature of the integrity of her photo and her, you know, respect in that way. So protecting the integrity of the image as well as the integrity of its use to stay within the spirit of sharing is kind of the idea. And, you know, so that's the default, but it is, a, and so it is up to everybody to enhance that if they want. Like we know, you know, or I know in talking with people, there are some, some partners, some of you out there who do want to do things like license your photos, but still want to share them through the archive. And to that end, you know, we have all decided, me, Katie, Amy, and Esteban, kind of boiled down to when we did say, what fields are we requiring in metadata, that one of those fields was going to be permissions, because we want everybody to have the opportunity to say, this is how we're defining this. Now, you can adopt our copy, copy left, a very open thing, or you can say things like, if you want a high resolution image of this, you need to contact this person because they are either the rights holder or the permission doing that kind of thing. And in that way, everyone will be empowered to define this complexity that was just you know, laid out for you. So the, the Benitos project is taking a position of like, this isn't really up to us. We're gonna adopt this one format to protect everybody under the blanket of this copyleft approach. But if you wanna do something extra or different, here's where to define it. But since you are sharing it here in the Medios Archive, obviously people are gonna be able to access it. They're gonna be able to look at it. They are gonna even be able to probably download it even if we don't turn in, technically we don't know how this works quite yet, whether we can turn off downloads or not, but really there's no point to doing it because if they really want it, all they have to do is line up a screenshot and shift command three it, and they're gonna have your image anyway if they really, really want it. So, you know, there's realities of the internet that we are just sort of, of doing. And then there is what we are, we are going to take as the archive to approach it. So to get back to all of that is, you know, what just got covered and as far as permissions during events and things like that, we're certainly going to help uh, create forms and things to help with all that because that's part of what we're doing, but it'll be up to everybody to decide that for yourselves and what works for you and what works for the people that you're working with because you're obviously going to know that better than us. And we want to be responsive to what you're doing rather than be uh, dictating in kind of that way is I think our general approach. So I'm gonna stop there and let everybody start to um, ask questions or whatever, or ask specifics about anything that I or Amy or Katie just said.